one more person. Yes. Come on, team. We'll get there. Have faith. Oh, and there's Margaret. I think we got it. All right, Je uh, Jessica, what do you think? Shall we begin? Yeah, I think we can get started now that we've got a quorum. Excellent. All right, everyone. Well, if you are looking for the Psychedelic Medicine Task Force meeting, you are in the right place, which is always a good way to start a Monday, huh? Um, uh, we've got some slides up on the screen. We always have the screen slides up to start our, <coughs> our meetings. And with just some reminders for our members, as well as for those that might be viewing this meeting. Uh, members, a uh, good time to ch check your controls, um, sounds. Uh, you know now that we uh, tend to not use <coughs> chat because not everybody's watching it, uh, myself included. I've got um, a, a shortage of um, monitor space, so we tend not to use chat. But we do use our mural, so you'll want to make sure, especially today, because we will be doing a lot of work on the mural. So members, go ahead and get into the mural. You've got the link within the meeting invitation that Jess sent out. Uh, so make sure you're ready to go for that. Uh, sure do appreciate when, uh, especially when you're speaking, to have your cameras on. It gets lonely here. Uh, so it's really nice to have uh, a visual lock on people as well. Uh, so please, uh, if you are able, uh, we appreciate your keeping your cameras on and your volume off unless you're speaking. Um, and our Jess, if you can move to the next slide, <coughs> excuse me, just a reminder of the staff members that are supporting your efforts, task, uh, task force members. We've got uh, several folks from the MDH staff, Carrie Glopen, and Dr. Carolyn Johnson, uh, you've spent a lot of time with both of them. Uh, our leadership within the task force uh, includes Dr. Jessica Nielsen, Bennett Hartz, and Paula DeSanto. Uh, and then your staff with MAD. MAD is your facilitation and support service for this initiative. Includes Jessica Burke. Jessica is the one with uh, the technical stuff uh, and sharing her screen and doing all of that, moving the slides around. Nick Core is part of our team as well, and myself, Stacy Shogren. Uh, so I will be working um, with our chairperson, Jessica, <clears throat> to make sure things are moving ahead and you get your decisions made today. And next slide, please. Uh, Meeting observers, uh, we while we are recording these, this meeting to um, simultaneously post it on Zoom, Jess, I'm not sure if I said that exactly right, but there we go, um, uh, uh, minutes will be taken and then posted on the website with a lot of other materials from this initiative. So if you want more information, um, please, the easiest thing is to just go over to the MDH website and do a search for psychedelic medicine. That gets you there quickest because y'all can't click on these links. It doesn't work that way. But we welcome any meeting observers to these meetings. We appreciate your interest. Um, we will, as I said before, be sharing our screen and you'll see the group working <clears throat> and uh, talking and making some decisions. Uh, and let's go to the next slide, please. The legislative charge for the Psychedelic Medicine Task Force is to survey existing studies of scientific literature, compare efficacy of psychedelic medicine within specific instances, and develop a comprehensive <clears throat> excuse me, plan for a legislative review. Goes on to, I think it's two more slides, so Jessica or Jess will move it forward slowly so you can take in a little bit more information as you need to. Uh, and then just one more, <coughs> and yeah, I'm sorry, everyone, I'm sick of my cough too. One more message to observers, and that is we would ask that you refrain from raising your virtual hand uh, or doing anything to engage with the task force members. This is their time to get their work done, and they've got a lot of it. So we appreciate your interest, but ask that you step back um, and let them allow them, allow them the space to get their work done. 
Um, and with that, I think we can move on to, um, to our next bit of housekeeping details. Uh, and uh, Jessica, if we want to go ahead and what, start roll call, do minutes from the last meeting, should we take care of some business? Yeah, that sounds good. Thanks, Stacey. And yeah, I just want to say thank you to all the members that are joining and, and the observers watching. Um, so first, we need to do just a roll call to make sure that we have a quorum secured before we start our business today. Um, and just a quick update um, that uh, Senator Morris has resigned from her Senate seat to run for Congress. Um, and we also announced last month that Senator Coleman also stepped down from the task force due to some time constraints. So we currently don't have a sen any Senate representation on the task force right now. So we're not fully seated at this moment, uh, but we do have a quorum. Um, and the Minnesota Department of Health is working with their legislative liaison to get these two seats filled. Uh, so just wanted to update folks about that. But now I'm going to turn it back over to Stacey to do uh, just a roll call. Um, so Stacey, do you want to go ahead and initiate that? I do. I do indeed. All right, fingers by your mute button so we can fire through this. We've got to do two rounds, one for roll call and one for minutes. So don't don't leave your screen. Uh, Courtney Amason, are you here? Here. And, and Helen Bassett? Here. Guthrie Capsella. Here. Paula DeSanto? Here. And Jeremy Drucker's gone today. That brings me to Stefan Egan. Here. Dr. Margaret Gavian. Here. Bennett Arts. Here. David Hong. Here. Nick Leonard's. Nick, Nick, Nick. Are you here, Nick? I do not have my participant list <coughs> open. I am going to assume He's Nick in is the meeting. Yeah. Nick, are you here? Well, well, I'll do it. I'll call him again and give a little extra time when we go through the minutes and see if he had to step away. Uh, Ari McHenry. Oh, sorry. Ari's absent today, uh, which brings me to Jessica Nielsen. Here. Kit O'Neill. Kit, are you here? Kit is absent. Jill Phillips. I'm here. Good morning, Jill. Good morning. Ken Sass. Here. Donovan Sather. Here. Uh, Rep. Andy Smith. I am here. Michael Tabor. Morning, here. Adam Tomsick. Here. And Ranji is gone today, which brings me to Rep. Nolan West. Nolan? Nolan, are you here? All right, I'm going to zoom back up uh, and just double check with Nick. Nick Leonards, are you back at your computer? Okay. All right, uh, Jessica, we do have a quorum, so we can proceed. Thank you, Stacey. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and approve the meeting minutes from June. So everyone should have received these materials uh, last week uh, to review. And so um, first we'll do, uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? From anyone, does so anyone? Move. Motion to approve. Okay, do we have a second? Who was who was the motion? Er, I, it was me and one other person. This is Adam Tomzik. Thanks, Adam. And I can second Courtney. Thank you, Courtney and Adam. Looks like Kit O'Neill just popped on as well. And you said, Kit, Kit, did you just join in? Hi. Yes, I was having some computer issues. No worries. I've got you present. Thank you. All right, we are running the vote for minutes from the June meeting. I'm gonna go with first names this time so we can scream on through and get to get to business. So, Courtney. Courtney? Sorry, yes, approve. Thank you. Uh, Helen. I'm gonna abstain. I was not able to be at the last meeting, so. Okay, Guthrie. Approve. Paula. Approve. 
And Jeremy's gone. Stefan. Abstain. Margaret. Approve. Bennett. Approve. David. Approve. Is Nick here yet? Yeah, I'm here. There you are. Yeah, sorry and about that. I, yeah, no, no worries. I approve. Yeah. So you're here. I want to yeah. just backtrack a second. And you're approving. Got it. Uh, that brings me to Ari. She's absent. Oh, darn it. You're right. Jessica. Approve. Kit. Kit. Approve. Thank you. Jill. Approve. Ken. Approve. Donovan. Approve. Andy. Approve. Michael. Approved. Adam. Approved. And Ranji and Nolan are absent. Very good. Motion carried. Thank you, Stacey. Right. Thank you, everyone, for reviewing the materials and voting. Okay, so now we're going to move on to um, some member collected feedback. So this is the opportunity for any of you if you've um, shared or had listening sessions with the various communities that you're representing on this task force, or if you're a state agency and you've had any consultations with your agency um, around what we're doing um, and any of the preliminary recommendations we've sent out to discuss, um, now's the time to do that. So we'll just leave it open if folks wanna raise your hand and come on camera and provide any updates from your communities at this time. Anyone? Hey, this is Bennett Hartz with the Attorney General. Um, I regularly bring updates to um, the Office of the Attorney General, and I don't have any um, substantive response uh, now. Um, I think we'll have uh, get clear direction when we have specific things to get thumbs up, thumbs down approval from um, the office on. Thanks, Bennett. Um, I know, Guthrie, you had sent out um, an invitation for something uh, that was like an educational event with Susan Bolio. Do you want to talk about that at this time and let people know about that? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, you know, one of the things that that Donovan and I had been discussing here in the last few months was uh, how do we get some broader education and uh, feedback opportunities from, uh, you know, tribes here in the state? Uh, as, as my role uh, at Mayo Clinic, I oversee a monthly uh, health topics forum, um, and I was able to uh, secure Susan Bolio, who was the uh, original um, kind of the, the original nominee from, from my act that, that for some reason the state didn't, didn't allow. Anyway, she's going to come and, and present uh, on, on psychedelics, uh, and then we've modified I think you muted yourself, Guthrie. Sorry, there was a something on my, my mouse pad. Um, and then we'll have a survey to get feedback from folks that are in attendance as well as we'll have a um, sort of a round table session after the fact. So uh, really hoping to get some good information here in July. That's great. Thank you so much, Guthrie, for organizing that. Adam, you have your hands up? Yeah, just a question for Guthrie. Is this an event that is open to the public? Like would other people be able to attend? Are there going to be virtual options or is that in person only? Yeah, no, this is a webinar. I'd, I'd be happy to send it out to the group. Just didn't know if it was, you know, all, all that relevant to every, all the other communities, but be happy to send it out to everyone. Yeah, that would be great. If I, I would like to attend if possible. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Paula? Um, I would just like to add that I do have a email invitation out to Dr. Joseph Lee from Hazelden to get his perspective or their organization. So we're in the process of trying to get something set up. I'm meeting with a representative from White Earth tomorrow. And I had the good opportunity to talk with a handful of vets, um, former Army Ranger and group from Northern Minnesota that are uh, have extreme passion for the access to psychedelic medicine for that group. So a, few, a few encounters anyway. Yeah, great. Thank you, Paula. Right, any other updates from members before we move forward?
Okay. Oh yeah, Helen, go ahead. Yep, hi there. You know, t we get our little, uh, have to do our little uh, chat, you know, reactions and get them all lined up. But anyway, I actually have, uh, you know, send along a lot of information or the information kind of most updated to uh, several members of our uh, senior leadership team and kind of teed up for them that uh, this group will be moving toward making some decisions soon. And so uh, just so they're alert when some recommendations come back that they're able to get them. There also are a couple of interns in our office and one of whom has expressed interest and perhaps listening in at the public uh, meetings. And so uh, after this meeting and going forward, I probably will send that link to her so she can easily find it and, um, you know, just kind of follow along. And I think the webinar might be a good thing for her to uh, kind of listen in on too, since she's expressed an interest. So that's kind of my little update from Commerce. Thank you so much, Helen. Anyone else? All right, so hearing none, unless there's some last minute <laughs> raised hands, um, we'll move on. Um, so if Jess, if you could share your screen again so we can look at the um, meeting agenda today and just kind of do a high level overview of what you know our goals are for this meeting um, moving forward. Um, so if we could get that put up on the screen. All right, so we've already approved the June meeting minutes and done our member collected feedback. Um, then we're going to kind of do a high level overview and just remind folks of kind of our work cadence and the decision flow chart and our timeline um, and how we're hoping to kind of get our work done over the next few months. Um, we'll take a break and then we'll go over what the recommendation process will look like and kind of some mural activities that we're gonna be doing. Um, and then we're gonna talk about the presented recommendations that the working group has sort of come up with based on consensus and feedback from all of our previous meetings and discussions in the working group. Um, and we'll throw some breaks in there as well. Um, but this is going to be a time where we're going to heavily rely on just interacting on mural, getting all of your feedback from the materials that we sent out over the last week uh, to really start thinking about what recommendations we might want to um, finalize in our report and start writing up and figuring out what would be some good regulations and statutory changes needed to implement those. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, do we wanna go to the next slide? Right, okay, so again, this is just a really high level reminder of kind of the decision flow chart that uh, Nick Core has put together. I don't expect you all to kind of be able to read all of this. It's just sort of a general timeline of kind of where we're at and where we're going and where we are right now. Um, and so I created a more simplified version of this. If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is basically just showing, you know, from in December through January, we we're really just getting started up assessing like what were our guiding principles, um, what kinds of things that we want to explore further, what were the parameters of the scientific literature. And then um, up until last month, we were doing a lot of learning from subject matter experts, evaluating the scientific literature, and the working groups were meeting to really kind of get more information from additional subject matter experts and, and figuring out and refining what we would potentially discuss as recommendations. And so now we've moved into this sort of July through August phase, but we're really going to go more in depth into the recommendations that we've honed in on um, to discuss them further and determine which ones we actually want to decide upon. Um, then once all that's done, starting in December, we're going to start drafting this final report. And this is something we're all going to work on together um, to really get different sections of this report and whether we're going to actually have any recommendations um, or conflicting opinions about the recommendations and sort of what that will look like moving forward and really bringing in all of the data and resources from state agencies and communities to, to fill this report in uh, to submit to the legislature, which will be due on January 1st of 2025, uh, which is when the final report is due. All right, um, next slide, please. Okay, so now we're gonna go over to Mural and I just wanna give folks kind of a high level overview of how this process is gonna work uh, so people kind of understand what 
um, the process will be and, and how we're going to be sort of discussing some of these recommendations. And just want folks to know that we're not making any final decisions today. We're not doing any official voting. We're really just getting a pulse check on some very high level recommendation suggestions and which of those we might want to pursue further for um, identifying any regulatory or statutory changes that might be needed um, to actually implement those. So first we need to figure out which branches of our um, decision tree um, we want to do. So basically, um, so let me just run through this. So, so if you could show one of an example of this first decision tree, Jess. Um, so this sort of high level recommendation one. Okay, so this is a very, very, very high level snapshot of what could potentially be um, recommendation number one around decriminalizing uh, the psychedelic medicines that we're tasked with um, studying. Um, and I think throughout our meetings, we've we've decided that, or we've kind of come to a consensus that, you know, each of these psychedelic medicines are at different phases of approval and um, efficacy in the literature for certain conditions. Things are happening in different states with these to various degrees. And so we kind of came to a consensus that we probably should be thinking about each of the psychedelic medicines differently under the three broad umbrellas of recommendations that we have. And so that would be decriminalization as one recommendation. And do we want to look at each of those separately for MDMA, LSD, and psilocybin, either synthetic or um, naturally grown um, psilocybin mushrooms? Um, the second recommendation is around more research trials, again, looking at each three differently um, and whether we want to include natural mushrooms in that. And then the last one being um, a state regulated medical program um, and what that would look like moving forward. So, so what we're going to do initially is we're really only going to attach or attack each of these questions and each of these branching points one at a time. So for example, we will talk about decriminalizing MDMA. And what we're going to do is having looked at the chart and kind of seeing what the general umbrella is in terms of these decision trees and branching points, um, we'll do what's called a SWOT analysis. Um, and so for those not familiar, um, that's an, if you want to um, show the SWOT analysis, Jess, just kind of the higher level table. Um, and I think the text is a little small, but we basically... Um, are breaking things up into perceived strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. That's what this acronym SWAT stands for. And it's really kind of a, a tool that's used in the business world, I believe, to help companies evaluate new ideas. Um, and so we're going to be using this here to get a better sense of how each of you are currently landing on each of these potential recommendations based either on your experience in the community you represent or as a member of the state agency you work for and are representing here on the task force. And this work, <clears throat> this works by allowing everyone to share what the actual strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats are for a given recommendation. Strengths and weaknesses should be viewed as those that are internal to Minnesota and the different state agencies, whereas the opportunities and threats should be viewed as those that are external to Minnesota, such as federal laws and other factors that are somewhat out of our control, with the goal to transform and address any weaknesses to be able to turn them into strengths and to see what we can do to make any external threats, potential opportunities. And something to keep in mind for this work is not to necessarily identify a weakness that is just the direct inverse of a strength, um, because these ideally should be independent factors that we need to consider. Um, and so in this process, we'll give you all about five minutes for each individual kind of question that's being proposed to sit quietly and engage with Mural um, to fill those out. And so there's some boxes up at the top that you can grab, some text boxes that you can move in and try to weigh in on each of those. And we'll give you some quiet time to do that. Once that's done, we're going to move on to a discussion of the, of kind of maybe some of the themes that have popped up from the SWOT analysis and um, see if there's any negative, um, see if any of the negative points, threats, or weaknesses could be made into strengths and opportunities. Um, and then once we sort of had a good discussion about that, then we'll move on to what's called a gradients of agreement. So Jess, if you could just scroll down a little bit so folks can see what that looks like. So this is to get a quick pulse check on each recommendation before moving on to the next one. Um, so we will not be making again any final decisions or officially voting through this process today, but just sort of ranking whether you love, like, live with, are leery of, or loathe the idea. 
Um, so this will help us rule out potential downstream branches of this larger decision tree. So the working group um, over the next month can focus on coming up with additional downstream decisions to discuss and vote on for the August meeting and potentially we'll need to um, have more decision making done in September as we're starting to think about how these are getting finalized and how we're going to write it up in the report. And Jessica, if I may just yep. give a little bit more information as we've uh, tightened the screen in um, that Jess is sharing, or if you're looking at it on your own, um, there are dots next to each one of these gradients of agreement table. Grab a dot members and pop it in one of the five boxes that represents where you're coming from. You love it, you can like it, you live with it, leery of it or loathe it. If you end up putting your dot in either the leery or the loathe box, we want you to grab <laughs> another um, rectangle sticky note and put it in this area that's white in either of these spaces down below Leary or Loathe and tell us what your concern is and what you would need to see changed in the recommendation to get you up to at least being able to live with it. You don't have to do that extra step if you love like live with. We're trying to see if we can get the group up to at least those three areas, but want to hear from those that are at the leery or loathing stage. So two-step process if your dot lands in leery or loathe. Does that make sense? And if it doesn't, pop on your camera and or talk, pop on your microphone and let's talk about it. I want to make sure everybody knows. <clears throat> So far, so good. All right. Okay, so um, yeah, just wanna give one more opportunity if anyone has any questions before we dive into the, the first uh, sort of broad question and uh, SWOT analysis. Oh, and one more reminder for everybody, uh, Jessica did a fine job of explaining each of the four areas of a SWOT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. But we also have definitions for you if you just need a little bit of a reminder up above. Um, well, we've I've put them all over this so you can easily refer to them. <coughs> but it's up above and just to the right of the big brown box that says recommendations regarding decriminalization. Not over there though, Jess. Zooming out, zooming out, look for my cursor moving around. There you go. They're right up there. So if you need to refer to it, great. They're there for you. Yeah, thanks, Stacy. Mm -hmm. All right. So the first one that we're going to swat um, is this high level um, question. Do we want to decriminalize MDMA? Yeah, Adam. I don't want to get us too far off track here, but I understand that within the last month, there has been some type of development regarding MDMA at the FDA. I'm wondering if either Jessica or Caroline could give like a snapshot about what happened, what it means. No. Yep. Yeah, I can do that. Um, so if you all recall last month, Lycos, um, which is the sort of pharmaceutical company that's pushing MDMA assisted therapy towards FDA approval. And so they presented to us at our task force meeting last month. And the next day there was this all day FDA advisory panel meeting to review um, their new drug application and whether they would recommend MDMA approval for PTSD um, to the FDA. This was an independent advisory committee um, that wasn't necessarily affiliated with the FDA. The FDA takes their recommendation under advisement, but doesn't always agree with the recommendations that they provide. Um, so what happened was that this advisory committee voted almost unanimously not to approve MDMA, stating that they didn't think that the benefits outweighed the risks, given some methodological confounds with functional unblinding, given the kind of unique nature of MDMA and how intense the experience is and how 
hard it is to actually have a, a good placebo and um, blinding um, for everyone kind of observing and experiencing MDMA and whether they got the drug or not. So, so that seemed to be kind of a wrench in the system, um, but also wanting to point out that FDA has been working with Lycos, formerly MAPS Public Benef Benefit Corporation, since 2017 when they granted it breakthrough therapy designation and knew that there was these kind of meth methodological confounds and knowing that they were going to have to maybe look at this a little bit differently. Um, and so they were involved in kind of a pro special protocol assessment since the beginning of them starting the, the process of doing this, their phase three clinical trials. So it's unclear whether the FDA will go with that recommendation or with they will or if they will approve MDMA. Well, we won't know until August 11th when they're supposed to be making that decision. Um, so it's kind of up in the air. 22% of the time, the FDA goes against the recommendation of this independent advisory panel. Um, so we'll just have to wait and see. Um, Adam, did you have another question or did that kind of yeah, get out? Yeah, just as a follow-up, does any of that undo the work that Caroline did in terms of um, summarizing uh, the like the benefits of MDMA. I can't remember how long her document was, but at some point Caroline wrote a document and presented on MDMA specifically. I'm trying to find it right here. Um, the MDMA literature review, mm -hmm. uh, the 14 page document that we got earlier. Does that, does that undo that? Or is it more of an issue with the nature of the study itself as opposed to the nature of the effects and the yeah. benefits good question so it doesn't undo the science that's already been done this is really around how are people interpreting whether the way that the study was done is accurately reflecting efficacy beyond a placebo effect which is why you do these double blind trials so that's sort of what's being called into question that the efficacy could be mostly driven by the fact that people knew they were getting MDMA, um, but it doesn't change the facts of the science and the literature that's already been reported and the data that went into the new drug application. Um, some other issues were that there wasn't um, accurate monitoring of certain health or concerns around, was there any liver toxicity or kidney issues that just weren't measured? Um, and so those are things that, um, Lycos is addressing and it's possible. And we heard a little bit about what's called a REMS program, which is like a risk evaluation mitigation system, where if it's approved, it's approved under specific conditions. And then they will very tightly regulate and monitor select sites that will be early adopters of delivering this to people and continuing to evaluate safety um, and probably effectiveness rather than efficacy, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Thank you so much for explaining that. Yeah. Um, and even if approved um, by the FDA, it wouldn't necessarily like legalize or reschedule MDMA itself. It would just be legalizing and rescheduling their specific formulation, like any pharmaceutical. Um, and so we might have a bifurcated scheduling where MDMA is still federally on schedule one in general, but this specific product like Epidiolex from cannabis is specifically approved, but then cannabis isn't. So we might see something like that. So states just might have to deal with this a little bit differently depending on what those legal realities look like moving forward. Um, so any other questions about this before we start swatting uh, decriminalization of MDMA? Okay, so I'd say at this time, just everyone take like five minutes and um, head over to um, the swap table for um, decriminalizing MDMA. It should be the upper left one. Um, and just take five minutes to put your ideas in each of the perceived strengths, opportunities, threats, and weaknesses. Yep, and I'm gonna just grab everybody's screen too to get folks in the right place. So I'm controlling your screen just to get you situated. Here's where you're working first. You're grabbing sticky notes here, making your own, we don't care, and then moving down to the um, gradients of re agreement right below it. All right, so you can click anywhere and break my hold and go ahead and get to work.
members, this is Stacy. Don't hesitate to just come on microphone if you're having um, mural issues or stumbling in any way. Happy to help out. And you see me in there just making boxes bigger so people that are watching can see. So don't mind me. Stacey, are you tracking time? No, but I sure will. We've got about a half an hour to work in each of these broader areas. So probably good to start shifting down everyone to the gradients of agreement. Unless, Jessica, do you want to talk through and kind of have the group step back and see what's being produced here first? What are, what's your thought? Yeah. Yeah, because um, I do want to leave time, you know, if we want to discuss any of this before we work on um, the gradients of agreement and kind of where people are at based on what we're seeing. Okay. Um, some of the Would you like to do that walkabout or do you want me to do it? Um, I can take a crack at it. Um, okay. I do want to let folks know there was a recent uh, Supreme Court case that was um, overturning the Chevron deference. I won't go over into the details of it, but it was a, a longstanding 40 year law that was basically um, allowing federal agencies such as the DEA and the FDA and other federal agencies to have um, sort of final say on enforcement of any um, statutes that might have been ambiguous. Um, so an example of this would be the Right to Try Act where it wasn't clear whether that would apply to Schedule One drugs. Um, and the DEA has always said, no, um, we would not allow Schedule One drugs under the Right to Try Act. Um, but given that that's changed, that might now be on the table. So there's all kinds of unknowns at this point um, in terms of what could be federal threats. And so I just want that to be on people's minds as we're thinking about this. Um, so yeah, trying to look at some consensus on this. Um, does anybody just kind of want to chime in um, and ask any questions or have any thoughts about what you're seeing based on this? Or otherwise I can I can do that. And I know it does help if we can just take each box one at a time. So perhaps people could focus in on the strengths quadrant, the upper left-hand quadrant, and just take in the information that's there if you haven't absorbed other comments beyond your own. And I'm seeing themes around like just, you know, not having crim criminal penalties for possession. It might make it easier to access, um, promote equity of access, um, access to something that's potentially a valuable treatment. Um, it's consistent with broad public opinion about previous controlled substances. Um, I think this ties into the fact that both the Minnesota Medical Association and the American Medical Association have endorsed the decriminalization of all drug possession. So any thoughts from folks about these, these strengths that are coming through? I've got one observation here and you can see my cursor moving around the, what color is that, blue box? I'm somewhat concerned that the task force may be uh, out front in a manner, that one. I'm wondering if that's actually not a strength, but perhaps should be moved to a different box. Uh, is it a weakness? Is it an opportunity or a threat? Um, I'm, I'm honoring what's being said here. I'm just not, I'm not sure if it's a strength. So if somebody would like to uh, if the author of that is comfortable, um, if, if think about or help us understand why it's a strength. Well, that's me. This is Helen. And, yeah, you, know. you know, the box is so little, uh, you know, so it's take, so I'm looking at my own screen. And so for me to get to my own screen and get it oriented and then get the box in the right spot and the text ah. the right size, you know, is a little bit. So it may be in the wrong box. I, I certainly can concede that. Uh, yep. However, um, this is, you know, so maybe thinking about where it might be better placed, but uh -huh. uh, I don't think my sentiment's going to change because that's what my sentiment is. It's so, totally fine. I'm not, uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm no, not, I, I, I don't feel like you are, but I'm just saying, so it's yeah, more yeah. that it might be in a different, a different spot might be better. Yep. I'm um, open to that. 
are are you okay if I'm, I mean, would it oh, be a better do. fit? Oh, please do. I'm okay. always happy to have help. <laughs> <laughs> Helen. All right. So for now, yeah. Oh, I just feel like that might be a, a, a threat potentially if it's sort of like, what's the FDA going to do, you know, and then that's sort of like, because the okay. threats and the um, opportunities are things that are kind of yeah. extra to us and things we need to think so, about. Absolutely. Helen. Thank you. Yep. Yep. And remember, if you're using your roller, you can zoom in with your roller on your mouse and it may be a little bit easier for you to see uh, where th things are. So just just know that. But we got it moved for you. And it, it, it's all good. Back Thanks. to you, Jessica. Yeah, Margaret, you have your hand up? I do. I just I'm seeing similar comments to mine. And so instead of just putting another sticky note, can like how do if I'm seeing something I would have said, do we just thumbs up it? Like, how do we count that? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So if you hover over it. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So just thumbs up things I would have said, but someone else already said. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So for everybody else, if you hover over it and left click with your pointer finger, a menu will drop a uh, pop up a horizontal bar and you'll see a little smiley face with a plus on it. If you click on that, that's how you what like a statement, like a sticky. For some reason, that's not working for me, Stacy. I mm -hmm. I'm trying to do a plus, and it just doesn't show up. Is that so, working, is it working for everybody else? I think if you so, click on the box, it doesn't let you do that. You have to just kind of hover over it, and then you'll see like a little. <coughs> Add reaction in the bottom left corner that you can click on. But yeah, I think you have to zoom in really far into the box. To oh, see. okay. I think I see that now. Yep. And your work around you know, everyone, just make another little sticky yep, and stick it close to it says okay. me too or whatever. There's a bunch of different options. Yeah, I think you can also do like an arrow from one box to attach your box and then it's like mm -hmm. a continuation of that maybe. Yep. Appreciating, appreciating all the engagement. Thank you. Yeah, this is terrific. I love data. <laughs> and have people moved on to kind of assess what's in the weaknesses box, the upper right? Or maybe you've all moved on because you're moving a lot faster absorbing the information than I am. Yeah, so so I'm seeing themes around, let's see, use is not the same as healing, you know, so is this going to be something that people can access for healing, even though it's not FDA approved or a medical program? Um, treatment services being enacted beforehand, unsure, I mean, it's obviously a schedule one drug federally, um, and it's also a schedule one in our state. Uh, some Skepticism around the legislation around this being approved in the legislature. Yeah, any other thoughts from members around any of these perceived weaknesses? All right. So do we want to move on to opportunities? If there's yeah. no discussion to be had around the weaknesses. Um, so opportunities, these again would be um, potentially things from, you know, external issues. Like I put this note about the Chevron deference. And so the reality of how these things are enforced at the federal level might change moving forward. Um, but uh, obviously the main opportunity here is just access and people not being punished. Um, some instances around uh, the VA being able to potentially use it outside of the federal system. Yeah, Self-medication. Oh, 
I'd say there might be some things that might not be accurate. And I don't know how we want to navigate that. Um, or if we want to clarify some certain things that might not be true. Um, I'm just, I'm looking here at this easier to obtain MDMA for clinical trials. Um, a clinical trial would not be able to be conducted with a controlled substance just because it's decriminalized. It needs to come from a pharmaceutical company that has an agreement with the DEA and the FDA. Assuming all of that's not just going to fall apart because this Chevron deference was overturned. It's unclear what this is going to look like moving forward. Um, but that, as I currently understand it, wouldn't actually make it easier for MDMA to be used in a, in a sort of FDA, DEA approved clinical trial just because it's decriminalized. So I just want to clarify that for accuracy. And Jessica, what you may want to do when you <laughs> have a quiet moment is just to make a comment, uh, click on that box, make a comment on it, you know, the comment option, and then people can go ahead and read that. That may be an easy, easy solution if there's um, more information that would be useful. All right, in interests then, Jessica, of folks moving along, shall we have them look at the threats box, bottom right hand, threats box? Yes, um, and again, it looks like there's a comment, decrim nature seems like an easier path. I don't know that that's explicitly a threat or if that would be uh, either a weakness or sorry, a strength or an opportunity, just whoever authored that might wanna move that. Um, so yeah, it looks like there's sort of some perceived threats around like, what does this mean for public safety? Is this gonna increase unregulated use? Are we gonna have, you know, unregulated supply that could be contaminated with things like fentanyl? Um, we see this a lot with methamphetamine lately and other kind of sort of powdered drugs. Um, yeah. Something around, you know, if people are trying to make MDMA, um, you know, a lot of the the compounds that are used to make it are highly monitored. Um, any other thoughts from folks? If, if there are none, then, <coughs> Jessica, before we move the group down to the gradients, I'd like to just take a moment and uh, explain to them how the leadership team really thought ha long and hard about the five models for ethical decision making. Right. Is this an okay right. time for, no, no worries. Yeah, Is this an okay I time for me to do that? Absolutely. I think we probably should have mentioned it before we yep. started this, yep. but now is a good time. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to grab everybody's screen again and bring you down. This is just below that brown long box with all the opening information. You'll remember at our last meeting when we asked all of you to weigh in on what kind of thinking, group thinking tools and decision making tools resonated the most with you. Many people. Uh, we're curious about using the five models of ethical decision making. And I have to say, I gave it my very best shot trying to figure out how we could take this information, these five different models, and put into a group process. And got, I, I got stumped for a number of reasons. So you can see how I've put together for each of these models, if you follow the arrows, a way of group conversation. But just for example, if you look at the common good approach on the bottom right in the brown, I had a hard time thinking about, well, what community are we talking about? What, what good for what individuals? It, it got to be um, really messy when it came to the virtues approach, even though I understood it in concept, when it came to me to think through, well, who's virtual or who's virtues, whose framework, how do we do this when we're all coming at this with different 
frameworks of values and morals, then I kept running into another uh, kind of roadblock. So we spent a lot of time as a leadership team thinking about, can we make this work? Ultimately, we couldn't figure out how to make it work in this setting, which is why we went to your other choice and pulled out the SWAT and the gradients of agreement. Now, that's not to say when it comes to a point, and we're, we're getting there, when you want to weigh in on, do you love this idea, like, live, leery, loathe, you don't take some quiet time and just run it through how you would approach these five models of ethical decision making and then vote accordingly. I just couldn't figure out a way to make it work for a large group. So I wanted to honor that because that was something that was important to all of you and admit that I, I ran into a roadblock, just ran into a roadblock. And if any of you want to geek out on group process and have a great conversation with me later on offline, I am all for it because I'd love to figure out a way to make some aspects of this work. I just couldn't figure out how to do it. So with that, Jessica, I'll turn it back to you. If you think the group is ready to tee up their great for this first decision point. Yeah, thank you, Stacey. And, huh? and yeah, just I, the the um, five models of ethical decision-making to me kind of struck me as similar to our guiding principles of just like kind of have that in the back of your mind of where's your own kind of moral compass as you're, as you're weighing all this information and making decisions about this. Um, so going down to the gradients of agreement. So this is just sort of the broad, do we want to pursue decriminalization of MDMA and just put one circle uh, based on how you feel, whether you love it, like it, live it, live, can live with it, or if you're leery of it or loathe it. And again, if you're leery or loathe it, um, put a comment um, in the box below as to why. Thank you. Yeah, nobody gets to ride the line. I didn't make that clear. You got to pick one. So like I gave you five choices, everyone. That's a lot. It's like so much more than thumbs up, some thumbs down. So no line writing. Thank you. How about close to the line, Stacey? Yeah, well, that's <laughs> it's either in or out. <laughs> I do want to note that um, based on some feedback I got from Bennett meeting with some of the state agency reps that there will be options to abstain um, when we officially come time to vote. Um, so that will be an option and hopefully people will be willing to describe why that abstention exists um, for the report if, if it impairs our ability to actually come to a supermajority on any voting. But right now we would like to get everyone's feedback. So Stacey, I'm just tracking how many dots have been used and how many people we have and if everyone's weighed in. That's actually good. People. Nick, can you do a count on that for us? Our Nick? There's 17 task force members and we've got 16 dots right now. I had already done it, sorry. <laughs> so to that one remaining person, if you could make your Again, this isn't a formal decision. We're just doing a pulse check to see if this is even a branch that we want to consider in terms of how the working group's going to kind of come up with additional branch points and decisions and recommendations to discuss next month. Which is why if you're falling in leery or loathe, we really want to hear from you. What would it take, if anything, to be able to get you up to a point where you could live with the recommendation? 
So don't be shy about posting your thoughts in those. That's, that's gold. That's really important information for the work group. And that's 17 votes now. Okay. Everyone has voted. Very good. Great. Thank well, you. Jessica, Jessica, should we clip right along and get another one done here? Yeah, so next we're gonna, we're not gonna continue down the MDMA path. We just are trying to get some like really high level, like which branching points, starting points do we want to explore further? So next we're gonna move on to um, the broad kind of recommendation and path of whether we wanna decriminalize LSD. So we'll just give folks again, some quiet time to put um, your thoughts in the SWOT analysis boxes around perceived strengths opportunities, weaknesses, and threats of decriminalizing LSD. And if you're not sure where they are, I've just posted a follow me if you feel like it, because I'm focused in on exactly where you need to be. You can ignore me if you already know. And I want to mention that um, sticky notes can be copied and pasted. So if you have Ooh. any... Um, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, or threats that you have want to duplicate, you can just go and grab them and copy and paste from the previous, a previous box into the current box. And you do that by right clicking on top of the one that you want to duplicate, and then look at the menu for the du duplicate um, option. Go ahead, Kit. Just a question. Um, I think there might be a little bit of confusion as to what decriminalization would lead to for each of these um, like boxes. But this would be the first step to creating a state regulated program for each of these substances. Is that right? I don't I don't know that that would necessarily be the case um, because um, like you could create a state regulated program, but you have to decriminalize first, right? It, I can speak to that maybe a little bit. Um, basically this, we, we have state statutes in Minnesota that say, here are the different levels of criminal penalty for possession, sale, uh, quantity of possession, quantity of sale, et cetera, et cetera. And this would be like, I think de decriminalization means that, you know, sort of personal possession or use would not have a criminal penalty attached to it. And it doesn't say anything more about like, would this lead to a, um, a, a you know, a, a regulated market, a, a medicalized market? There, there's, that's not inherent in decriminalization. It would just be removing criminal penalties for, you know, sort of individual possession. Okay. So if, individuals were creating a substance for sale, would that also be included in decriminalization or is that more of like, eh? You know, that's that's a, a shade of question that I don't think is, is captured within the question of whether to decriminalize or not. I think that's ultimately a question for probably the legislature. Um, it would, because there's, there's, you know, there's sort of different levels of, criminal possession or a, a criminal penalty based on possession and use. And I think it really would be, I think that the proposal would be, you know, either decriminalize yes or no. And mm -hmm. then it would be up to the legislature to decide how far they, how far up the ladder they want to decriminalize, right? Do they want to decriminalize possession? Do they want to decriminalize possession of a lot? Do they want to decriminalize sale? Do they want to decriminalize sale of a lot? I would say probably, at least the way I'm thinking about it is I'm thinking about it do you, and this isn't like I'm not speaking and saying this is what the the um, uh, this is what this this exercise is about. But when I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking about decriminalization for like an individual person. OK, that's what I assumed. Thank yeah, you. and that's sort of reflected in that kind of flow chart that's to the left for this. And like there are potential pathways that the legislature could think about of like 
because the language in the Minneapolis deprioritization executive order was that cultivation and sharing with other people was okay. And you could also buy it from somebody, but you couldn't manufacture it on a commercial scale and sell it to people. So there was like a distinction. And I think in the sort of decriminalized nature movement that's kind of going on around the country, it's this grow gather gift model where it's not really supposed to have any like commerce around it. Okay, super. Thank you. Yeah. Great question. Jessica, the comments are starting to slow down here. So you may be able to go ahead and have some group um, review. Yeah, so we can cover. Four questions. Yeah, folks are kind of winding down on providing input here. We can kind of have a discussion around, around this high level recommendation to decriminalize LSD. And uh, we'll start with the strengths of this recommendation. Recommendation Again, sort of opening up access and equity. Uh, people won't be uh, criminalized for use and possession. Um, it's not necessarily a habit forming drug. Um, what else? A few health risks, people don't overdose. One question, Jessica or Caroline, is adulteration with LSD like in fentanyl, is that a concern or is it less of a concern than with MDMA where it's a mysterious powder? Yeah, that's a great question. I think with LSD, what you see more of is some other drug being sold as LSD that it's not LSD. So there's these things called N-bombs that are actually fatal. Um, that people will say are LSD. So there are kind of these other things that, so it's like, if it's LSD and you know for certain that it's LSD, it's usually pretty safe uh, physically, physiologically. Um, but it could be something else if you're just getting it from some random person and you don't have a testing kit or something. So, it, but it's less likely, likely that it would be fentanyl. Um, I haven't heard of that specifically, but who knows? Yeah. I mean, I feel like fentanyl is and everything, um, but it's more that it would be some other like research chemical or analog where people are trying to get around the Controlled Substances Act and creating something that feels similar, but then is has no real profile in the community for use and safety. And my understanding of how fentanyl ends up um, adulterating a lot of drugs is that fentanyl is um, really cheap to make. And so it ends up being a way to kind of cut costs in the production um, at the production phase. Uh, and I don't, I, because LSD is such a small quantity and it, at its effective level, I, I don't know if fentanyl is a cost effective way of cutting LSD. So yeah, I, in, in the studies I've looked at, I, I haven't seen, but you know, right. I mean, if, if, you know, decriminalization could change the market. So I, I could be speaking out of turn here. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the issue of these adulterated products coming through are, is really kind of a byproduct of criminalization where people are trying to get around the Controlled Substances Act and synthesizing all these analogs that are technically legal, but then they don't know what they are like in terms of like, how is it, how is someone going to respond to this? And, the, but then it's like, okay. So like, we're seeing this with these, there's FDA um, advisories or uh, warnings going out around people buying magic mushrooms online and they don't actually have psilocybin in them. They have these like weird tryptamine analogs that are giving people seizures. Um, and so they're putting out kind of a warning of like, don't buy these products. So I don't know if we would start to see some of that with LSD, but I think that's a byproduct of people having to try to get around the Controlled Substances Act. Yeah, Courtney. Sorry, I'm not trying to clap, but um, so my question is some of these things that are kind of being brought up, I'm not sure if we have or we could have the opportunity to address such as, um, you know, concerns about, you know, law enforcement and, you know, maybe even emergency room visits, because those are questions that we could really answer. And, um, and so I'm just curious if we have them, we've talked about it. But is there a way for us to kind of, because some of, in from what I've heard and from conversations, that that's not a reality, right? That um, this is something that's you know, in the emergency room and you see people like that's from people I've spoken to, that's just not happening. And so it, it's, it, you know, can we, is there a way for us to really address that directly? 
Yeah, if I'm hearing you correctly, if there's sort of like more emergency emergency room visits of people kind of having a bad experience on LSD and going to the emergency room and how to navigate that. Um, I do think there are <laughs> people do end up going because they're having a panic attack or they think that they're they're dying or something. And and sometimes the person, the first responder may not understand what's happening. Um, and so I think what other states are doing is like education of first responders of like if somebody comes to the emergency room. How do you navigate that if there's a law enforcement officer or an EMT encountering them, you know, talking about like, what does that look like? Um, but it's more around like people kind of just having psychological emergencies rather than physical or physiological. There's one case from Canada where a woman snorted a line of what she thought was cocaine and it was pure crystal LSD and it was like 500 doses. And she went to the emergency room and was kind of checked out for a while, but she was physically okay and ended up fine afterwards. Um, so it's more kind of dealing with that kind of panic that might come up. Did that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. And it's, and I just is more of a general question because there's other things on here, like what does law enforcement feel? Like, yeah. can we get those questions answered? Right, can we have more of, We've brought it up in the past, and I'm just not sure that that's really been something that has been answered. Yeah, and I think, I don't know, um, I mean, maybe this is a question for Ken Sass um, from Department of Public Safety. Is like, what are the concerns here around public safety under this umbrella? Whether that's a sticky note or speaking about it. So it's hard for me to, I think, to speak for all of law enforcement in the state of Minnesota. Um, but as far as Department of Public Safety, we always look at impacts, especially on traffic management, impaired driving, uh, emergency room visits that, that we talked about, um, the impact on first responders, the, the mental health of the general public that we come in contact with, especially uh, homeless population um, or populations where drug abuse potential is high. So those are all off the top of my head, some public uh, safety concerns that I have. Thank you, Ken. Can I just, thanks Ken, cause that's really helpful. Cause then it makes me think like, well, that's also something that we could like that harm reduction and education can really address, right? Instead of it being not in the public because we're not talking about it. So I appreciate that. Paula? I'm just curious if there's data that talks about uh, when, you know, when, when substances are decriminalized, does it really result in more use? Um, you know, do people use more because it's decriminalized or are people kind of using the same amount anyway? They just, because people that want to use, it seems like nowadays you can pretty much find anything you want. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, Adam, do you have a response to that? Yeah, um, in an email with Ari, couple weeks ago she mentioned something the effect of i can't remember what it was like the iron law of when you decriminal when you criminalize or prohibit a substance it ends up getting stronger and stronger and stronger because people want more bang for their buck and i can't remember the technical term for it maybe you know what i'm talking about um paula you were on that email too i can't remember exactly what it was called yeah you mean as far as they're they develop more tolerance and so they just kind of go after more is that what you're saying when things do become criminalized yeah and just the idea that it's concentrated you know more and more concentrated so you can conceal it and um all right i'm going to look through my emails i can't remember what it was but i, I do generally agree with that issue that when something is prohibited um and you put it underground People are, the iron law of prohibition is what Ari called it. Um, people are likely to take greater risks than they would if the substance was available and tested and you know what it was. It's just a curious question. And like, like you were mentioning too, Jessica, there's, you know, there's all these novel you know psychoactive substances out there where everybody's you know changing things and changing the analogs or molecular tweaks to kind of get around the controlled substances act anyway and so 
uh, yeah. And, you know, fentanyl is almost outdated now. It's xylazine and the, you know, the, the tranquilizer, the, the animal tranquilizers that are, are showing up. And um, we had somebody that just did some testing of their, of their dope and everything that you could imagine was in there. Uh, and that wasn't good news. Yeah. So. Yeah, I just, I'm probably living under a rock, but it was just um, reading that Oregon then has recriminalized their drug use. And I just was, they of course were leading, the leading state on decriminalizing drug use. Now they've recognized all the inherent problems and are reversing that. Can somebody speak to that, please? Yeah, I can speak to it a little bit. And then Adam, um, so they recriminalized because of fentanyl and more related to the opioids. And um, so when they decriminalized possession of all drugs, they had a whole program in place that, that was set up to try to do education and harm reduction that wasn't actually implemented or disseminated. And this was right when COVID hit and a bunch of fentanyl was hitting the West Coast. And so they just got they just, it, it turned into a really gnarly situation and it was mostly around the fear around fentanyl and overdoses. And it was actually happening in a lot of other states. It wasn't unique to Oregon. Um, and so they just sort of recriminalized everything and psychedelics got thrown into that, but it wasn't because of the extra use of the psilocybin service centers or anything that, that was the driver of that decision. Um, Adam, I don't know if you have more to comment on that situation. Yeah, I agree. It was, it had nothing to do with psilocybin. It had nothing to do with LSD. It was all about fentanyl and yeah, Oregon just didn't quite appreciate the nature of addiction, but it wasn't having anything to do with the psychedelic medicines that we're talking about. Um, I'll also, I, I want to speak to a little bit more detail about the program that was supposed to replace criminalization. Um, the, the major issue that they were trying to address with this new program was drugs of addiction. So fentanyl, um, probably methamphetamine, uh, uh, you know, drugs, drugs that are addictive drugs where people that, that where people can overdose. Okay. Um, so there was supposed to be a, uh, an, an alternative to criminalization. People would, uh, if someone was, for example, using fentanyl in the street, they could be given a, like a civil citation, or they could um, enroll in a uh, like a like a drug rehabilitation program that they would be, you know, given the contact information for at the same time that they were given the civil citation. That's the program that was set up, um, but it it never actually got implemented. the The decriminalization piece went into place, and the drug rehab piece didn't go into place, um, at least not quick enough for lawmakers in Oregon. So what ended up happening is you had this huge wave of fentanyl use um, and no rehabilitation program, you know, ready, ready to receive them. So that was the that was the the main mechanism that pushed Oregon to just say, OK, well, this is too big a problem with fentanyl. We're going to we're going to walk back this whole um, proposal. Yeah, Jill, did that answer your question? I, just one additional comment, though. So, I, I mean, I, you're right. The, the article that I'm looking at is is focused primarily on fentanyl. Um, but I'm hearing from the group that there is the kind of the mindset that um, LSD is not um, highly addictive or there isn't a potential for abuse. But the, the DEA has some the opposite to say about that. They specifically state that it's a powerful hallucinogenic and it has a high potential for abuse. So there is some disagreement there. Yeah, I think that comes down to what the FDA describes as, as those things around what is abuse potential, which is sort of any use of the drug, even just once, I think it's labeled as abuse potential. And then um, things with a high potential of abuse are things that by definition cause hallucinations, which things like psychedelics do. Um, and so I think it's, from my perspective, like why it's on schedule one is more around that less than, than like the safety issue and sort of like the definitions around that. I don't know, Adam, do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, everything has a high potential abuse for the DEA. You know, when 
all you have is a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail and you got to justify their two to $3 billion annual budget. So I, anything that the DEA says, I would really take with a grain of salt and understand that they have an economic interest in continuing to prohibit everything that is prohibited. Well, and also, um, thank you, Adam. Also, I, just in reviewing the Controlled Substances Act, like I think schedules two through five are evidence-based and schedule one is not. Um, people are, things are put on schedule one if there just seems to be the appearance of risk in the public. Um, but then other things that are like clearly dangerous and poisonous don't get scheduled on schedule one. So it's kind of unclear what is the justification for schedule one from my perspective. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's unclear. Yeah, I think the scheduling of MDMA in the 1980s is a good example of that. There was a, an administrative trial, um, basically the FDA on one side and the DEA on the other side about what uh, MDMA should be scheduled as. Um, the FDA, I believe, was advocating for Schedule 3, the DEA for Schedule 1. Um, the judge on the trial uh, ruled that uh, MDMA should be uh, rightfully scheduled as a Schedule Three drug and gave that order to the DEA. Um, but it is a recommendation rather than an order um, that comes out of those um, administrative trials. And so the DEA scheduled it Schedule One anyway. Um, and it's been Schedule One ever since. So that's that's kind of an example of, you know, there's, I mean, there, you know, there was an administrative, uh, you know, really ep thorough, you know, I think month long evidence based trial about what to schedule MDMA and um, the DEA just disregarded it and scheduled it schedule one anyway, because the perspective was, well, this is a, you know, a popular drug. Lots of people are doing it. We should probably get rid of it because, you know, what if there's associated harms or overdose or who knows? So it's like when in doubt, schedule schedule one, I think yeah. is the perspective. Thank you, Bennett. Um, so I want to be mindful of time. I know we're due for a break um, and this is going a little bit slower than I was hoping, but I'm really excited that everyone's engaging and, and putting information on there. So um, why don't we finish up this exercise for LSD? I think we've had a good amount of discussion. Hopefully we've kind of touched in a variety of less explicit ways, the strengths, opportunities, weaknesses, and threats. Um, is there any more questions or, or things that people want to talk about before we do a gradient of agreement? Yeah, Jess? Uh, in the threats box, there is, uh, of the four substances we are considering, MDMA uh, is probably the most likely substance to be abused in the LSD uh, question. So I'm just wondering if the person who did that meant to say LSD or if that's supposed to be in the MDMA box. It's just... Are we talking about me. this one? Yeah, that was me. I'll move it to the MDMA um, okay. threats. I don't know how that. Okay, All right, so if I'm under, <clears throat> understanding where, where we are right now, Jessica, you want people to move down mm -hmm. to the gradients of agreement. I think some people have already <coughs> been filling it out. Just a reminder, uh, keep things out of the dark blue boxes um, down below. Uh, you, you need not. In fact, I prefer you not comment in the love like leery or love like live with boxes down here. Just comment on the leery or loathe. And a reminder, if you're falling in the leery or loathe category, please, I see more people putting in comments, please let us know what you're thinking. If there's a way to move the or adjust the recommendation that would get you up into at least a live with without losing everybody else. I think we have 17 responses yep. just looking for those extra comments for the Leary and Loathe. 
we want to take this opportunity to go on our first break? I think that's a great idea. People have been working hard. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. <clears throat> so maybe come back at 11.05. Does that work? Eleven oh five. It is. Nobody thought that was a terrible idea. So come back at eleven forty five or uh, eleven oh five, and we'll tackle this next area. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. This is Jessica's voice you're hearing. Um, we've got about two more minutes left on our break. Um, so hopefully you'll uh, be able to come back in about two minutes so we can resume our SWOT analysis of these recommendations. Thanks. And Jessica, this is Stacy. I hope this is okay just talking through logistics right here, right now. But are, are you? shall we just keep marching through all, all four levels in this first decriminalization? Or do you want to stop at three and move on? I mean, what's what's going to be most useful, do you think? Going deep and getting in a whole area done? Or like just to, a few? Yeah, sorry. Uh -huh. um, I think it would be good to get through the decriminalization. Um, mm -hmm. For psilocybin, it's a little different because in general, psilocybin decriminalization would apply to both synthetic and natural mushrooms. It's just sort of what are the downstream regulations if that... Okay drug were to be decriminalized, but we okay. do have two separate SWATs for it, given that there might be other allowable behaviors that would be more okay. feasible under the mushroom model. Um, okay. <clears throat> I just That's kind of think of it as a high level, like just let's just think about psilocybin if we want to tackle other things around mushrooms. Yep. Um, maybe we can kind of do them together. Yep. Uh, people comment on that. <clears throat> okay. Sounds good. And then, uh, and then it could be that we'll just have to encourage people to come to the mural on their own time if we don't get through everything and finish up the boxes. Yeah, I'm hopeful we can maybe get through this. It would be good. Maybe we can move um, next instead of doing recommendation two, uh, which is research trials, which is really just about funding allocation and move over mm -hmm. to the state medical program, which is a little bit more. Okay. Um, All right. There's a little bit more discussion, I think, because it, it's not just with the okay. state or not. All right. Thanks, everyone. Well, we just figured out what we're doing, and it looks like we're at 11.05. So, Jessica, if I may turn it back over to you to introduce the next section. Yeah, thanks, Stacey. All right. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to move on to the next kind of high-level decriminalization discussion around psilocybin. So there's two separate swap boxes for this, um, but in general, if psilocybin were to be decriminalized, that would apply to all versions of psilocybin, um, uh, which would include sort of synthetic versions as well as magic mushrooms. So kind of have that in mind and maybe put your boxes and in, in ideas in both and we could kind of tackle this at the same time. Because really what this would look like is if we decide as a group to decriminalize psilocybin, the regulations around whether we allow people to cultivate um, might be different versus synthesizing um, synthetics, which is harder to do. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind when you're evaluating the strengths, opportunities, weaknesses, and threats of psilocybin, either in its synthetic form or in um, natural homegrown mushrooms. And it, let's just check in and see if any member has any question on that too, that you're doing double duty here with both of these SWATs kind of at the same time. Is that clear to everybody? If it's not, please come on your microphone and, and yep, go ahead, Adam. Yeah. Question. Um, I have never heard of or encountered like psilocybin that's synthesized, like floating around the community or people getting 
arrested with synthetic psilocybin like every every instance i've ever heard about about somebody possessing psilocybin has been in the context of mushrooms i'm just wondering if like synthetic psilocybin is it out and about outside of you know tightly controlled research drugs that are going through the fda process yeah um i don't know if that's the case if that's what's being used in some of these like mushroom products that people are selling online i don't know if they're like synthesizing that or not there's also the potential that once there is a psilocybin product that's fda approved there could be diversion of the synthetic version uh, that people are accessing in clinical settings so that is a possibility but yeah the more common form of it is just mushrooms um i don't know is that something um Stefan, I don't know if this is something you can speak to if you know about that. I feel like you you know a lot about synthesis of tryptamines. Yeah, um, so there is a few companies out there now um, selling illicitly, but openly, using synthesized psilocybin or psilocin, uh, coming whether in a crystalline form, pressed into a tablet, straight crystalline, or even vape cartridges. So it's out there, um, which is why I'm, I'm adamantly against like the decrim of psilocybin in general, home cultivation, mushrooms themselves are safe, but knowing the mistakes that I have made in a lab, I can only imagine what others would be making in a lab. And that could be extremely detrimental to both the uh, quote unquote scientist or the consumer itself, especially with these vapes, who knows what they're being cut with. Yeah, thanks, Stefan. Yeah, and I think that's why there's different kind of decision trees below each because then it's like, that requires, you know, manufacturing, would that be allowed versus allowing cultivation, which might look different in terms of feasibility and safety and things like that. Paula? I guess I'm curious about your statement that you said if we were to go with decrim, it would include synthetic as well as um, naturally grown. But why? Why couldn't we go with that decrim movement that you were talking about that was, you know, grow, gather, go, grow, gather, gift more about decrimming nature? Why are they together? Well, I think because the way that the Controlled Substances Act worked, it's really around like the the active ingredient. So mushroom, psilocybin mushrooms are not illegal. It's the psilocybin and the psilocin that's inside them that's a controlled substance. Same thing like dimethyltryptamine. It's in a ton of plants. Those plants aren't illegal, but the, the compound is. Um, so it's just kind of a distinction that, you know, in the statute were this to happen, then it would just be psilocy psilocybin or psilocin. And that would kind of have the broad category of the different ways that it shows up. Does that make sense? Kind of, but, but aren't there, aren't there uh, any states that are actually looking at just sticking with nature in their laws? Yeah. So that's what Colorado did with their natural medicine health act. Yeah. But, but they, they talk about like, the extractions or something where there might be some process to make it. Um, it's unclear because um, they haven't actually started implementing anything yet. Um, but I think in like Oregon, they're just growing mushrooms. Um, so it's unclear. It's unclear what this space is going to look like moving forward, especially, I don't know. I feel like the foundation changes every month, especially now with the Chevron deference being overturned. It's unclear what could be challenged in this vein around sort of subjective decisions made by the DEA previously at an administrative level versus what's actually statute. So members are working on both of these SWAT boxes at the same time, decriminalizing psilocybin and decriminalizing psilocybin mushrooms.
right, so maybe we'll take a few more minutes on this. Again, making sure folks are kind of weighing in on both the kind of synthetic general psilocybin option and then further distinguishing mushrooms. Um, we'll just give a few more minutes and then we'll open it up for more discussion. Members, you may have noticed that there's a big brown box to the right of the area we've been working in, a parking lot for recommendation number one, just a place for you to pop a comment or some sort of logistical concern larger than what you're working on right now with the SWAT and the gradients. So feel free to make, a, make use of that. We've got one set up for each of these three large trains of thought that we're working on. I think I want to move on to um, some open discussion around this. So um, do folks have any questions or themes that are emerging that they want to talk about or clarifying questions around what this umbrella might look like? I did want to mention, I see a lot of uh, cost versus benefit for society. Just want to remind everybody that, um, you know, these treatments are proven to reduce veteran suicide. Um, been effective in treating PTSD. So in the long run, it would actually I believe we reduce cost of financial costs as well as like societal costs for for treating veterans and then um, is not it's, it's, you can't really say that um, you know, there's any evidence that it would reduce veteran suicide. Most of that evidence is anecdotal, but there is quite a bit of that out there enough to say for me it's enough to say that yeah, the, the benefit is pretty significant yeah, thanks mike any other points of discussion uh, before we move on to our gradients of agreement for this yeah yeah just, just real real quick, quick. Um, we have, we have discussed, discussed it, David, we've discussed it at length in the past. Just, just uh, the, the integration, integration within ceremonial, ceremonial uses, uses and religious uses, uses I, I think, think, you know, it's you know, something, something to be considered, considered with both the synthetic as well as, as, well as um, 
as well as, well as, as plant-based, plant -based, and, and I'm, I'm going to be interested to watch uh, here, here in a couple weeks when we have that discussion. All with Susan, as she might draw one of those most comparisons, but I think, you know, this really breaks down into some of that religious access stuff that we've been talking about in the past few months. Guthrie, this is Stacy. I, I think everybody un heard and understood what you were saying, but we were getting some reverb from you. So it may be that you've called in on your phone and on your computer. Could you just double check to see uh, your mic settings here? Because we're getting we're getting double. And if anybody wants you to have another go at what you were sharing with the group, that's just fine. I just want to make sure that people have heard. Yeah, my, yeah, my apologies. apologies. I'm sort of, sort of moving, moving around, around as we've got this long meeting going, going, so I'm bouncing, I'm bouncing back, back and forth, forth and we'll, we'll, we'll see. see. Sorry, Sorry about, that. about that. Yep. Thanks for that. I think if just to see if we're hearing that correctly, it's around kind of more ceremonial um, religious use of mushrooms, whether that would apply to some of the synthetics. Um, and then hopefully Susan Bolio will be talking about that at the Mayo meeting later this month. Correct. Correct. Yep. yep. So all the members right now should be voting uh, on the gradients of agreement for both of these areas, do them simultaneously. I'm glad you brought up the sort of ceremonial and religious use, Guthrie. Another member um, mentioned that as well, um, sort of offline, um, because there are different states that are exploring like RIFRA unique to this. I know Utah passed something that would allow religious freedom in whatever context that looks like. So people are trying to challenge this uh, with the DEA to use psychedelics in the context of a religious ceremony. Um, so whether that happens as its own thing or it's sort of allowable under decrim is sort of unclear at this time. I don't know if others have thoughts on that. Yeah, I would just like to chime in a little bit just because I've been doing a little just research into it. And I understand that, you know, while uh, RIFRA was originally a, a federal um, statute, um, it was limited then in 1997 to, um, uh, it, it was, more broadly, and then it was limited in 1997 to just federal um, organizations. And so as a result, 21 states now have passed their own RIFRA legislation or statutes. And I, I just would like perhaps to have some time at a future meeting or in our work group to talk about what that means to have your own state uh, uh, RIFRA and how, if that's something we wanna look at. I think that we're still missing some um, member votes here, if my counting is correct. If there is reason for you not to want to vote at all, members, it'd be helpful for us to know a little bit more about the why. And perhaps you could post that information over in that parking lot brown box uh, to the right of the space that we're working in. My cursor is running around it right now. Yeah, thanks, Stacey. I think we've got about mm -hmm. five people that still need to weigh in. If we get down to one person remaining, uh, Nick Leonard's is in a meeting until oh. from 11 to 11.30, but he said he would be monitoring and okay. uh, adding his input. Good to know.
And Jessica, it's up to you when you're ready to move on. Yeah, so it looks like all but two people um, with the knowledge that Nick is on a meeting. Um, so there's just one more person, but um, if whoever you are, you could just provide your your feedback, that would be great. Um, but we're gonna, yeah, move on to the next high level recommendation. Um, I'm gonna skip recommendation two for now because based on what we talked about last month, um, there was pretty much unanimous support for more research and that really is something that's already legal and, and able to be done. Um, designing a clinical trial just involves working with the FDA and the DEA and an ethics committee IRB. And really what's needed is figuring out who would be allowed to run clinical trials. Would that be funded by the state? Would there be a grant program set up for that? Um, so I think that would be more straightforward. Um, and so I think for today, the purposes of today's meeting, I'd like to move on to recommendation three, which is around a state medical program. And I do want to highlight that, you know, I know we were talking about last month, kind of four broad areas where there was kind of an adult regulated use that was non-medical, um, which had a lot more sort of opposition in terms of we had the green circles and the red circles, and there was just a lot more red across the board with the exception of um, psilocybin mushrooms, which seemed to potentially have more support than um, doing uh, a state regulated program with, with psilocybin. Um, so I want to honor that, um, as sort of like a consensus, um, but know that it's not necessarily something we don't need to address in the report. You know, we could definitely continue to explore that and provide some information about what that looks like, especially given other states are doing something like that. Um, but at this time for today's discussion, I, I didn't add it as something that we would be making decisions about given that there was not a whole lot of support in general for that that pathway. Um, so uh, are there any thoughts about that before we move on to the state medical program high level recommendation discussion? Okay, hearing none. And if you do have something, just go ahead and raise your hand or pop on the mic. Um, so recommendation three high level is a state regulated medical program where um, we kind of first want to decide, you know, do we want to explore synthetics or natural mushrooms? Um, and so I think for the purposes we'll approach this like we did with decrim, um, a state medical program would look a little different with synthesizing psilocybin, LSD, or MDMA outside of the context of what the pharmaceutical companies are doing. So this would involve, you know, potentially labs authorized by the state to make a supply for a medical program. And this is what's happening in Utah. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of that, but they kind of are creating legislation around um, and rulemaking around what that would look like so that they have a supply in their state for a three-year pilot program. Um, so basically what we want to do is figure out, you know, do we want to explore a medical program where people would be doing this kind of like the medical cannabis program um, for MDMA? Um, so we'll tackle this one first. Um, so again, going back to our SWOT analysis, from your perspective, what would be the strengths, opportunities, weaknesses, and threats of a state-regulated MDMA program for specific conditions of mental health um, and other conditions that might be benefited by MDMA? So we'll give you about five minutes to engage with, with the mural on this activity. Thank you. And I'm noticing people are putting stuff in the box for the clinical trials and just know that we're kind of um, moving down to recommendation three. So if you could take those comments and put them down below um, in the third section for recommendations regarding the state medical program and not recommendations regarding more research trials. Quick question, Jessica. See, could, you, could you go where we need to go? I'm confused about where we're supposed to be. I'll just follow you. Yep, I will, um, I will invite you to follow me. Hold on a sec. And just a quick question. I, I, I think, is Utah the state that, that set up a medical program based on like one or two very specific hospitals where people would go into an inpatient setting and engage in a highly regulated medical model? 
Yeah, that was that was Utah. Um, they this was in the last month, I think the legislature passed it and the governor signed it. It's it's basically the medical model for people who don't know, um, but only within a, a very few limited number of hospitals in the state. Right, right. So to talk about what a state medical program looks like, and then referencing our cannabis program and and Utah's model, they're like you know very divergent, and so I, I guess I. I feel like I don't know what that would even mean to have a state medical model. And so but that, I'll write that down. I'll just need to I'll write that in, in my little mural exercise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like what, what would be a threat or an opportunity or a weakness of that? Um, because, you know, each state gets to decide what they want to do um, and what regulations and statutes they want to put in place regarding that. For Utah, it was any psychedelic medicine that had been granted breakthrough therapy designation by the FDA, which is the three that we're looking at. But then there wasn't like a clear distinction on the supply. And so there's potentially labs that are being developed that are state run. All right, so try to find your final uh, thoughts and comments to um, complete this part of the mural activity and we can open things up for discussion around what are some perceived strengths um, of this approach. Um, obviously access, being people to be able to use this in a clinical setting, not having to wait. <laughs> Uh, for FDA to approve it and DEA to reschedule it um, are some of the strengths I'm seeing. Access, access. And I would just want to echo Jessica, kind of what you were saying. It seems like the, you know, the landscape is changing so quickly with this recent, you know, Supreme Court court ruling around, you know, how how much power do federal organizations have around ambiguous statutes and states that are moving ahead with this, setting some precedents. And so I think um, it feels like since we've been started as a as a task force from where we are today, that risk of kind of getting caught up in the federal crosshair seems to be loosening. Yeah, and I'm still not sure what the implications are going to be of that. I'm not a lawyer, um, and a lot of the lawyers I've been asking are just kind of hesitant to comment yet before they fully understand what the ramifications will be. Um, but a lot of those things, it's either like previous stuff and regulations might get overturned, but all of that I think is going to just clog up the, the legal system with, with litigation trying to change certain things. It's not just like, oh, automatically this thing will change. It's like you have to like – then try to like for the right to try act, for example, they've been suing the DEA to say, you need to allow us to use psilocybin in patients, you know, where we think that there's an unmet need here and the DEA saying no. So that would have to go back to trial. They would have to like re re sue them. And now knowing that they are not allowed to make that administrative decision and it would be up to the judge to make that decision. So I don't know what that's going to look like with all of this. You know, at this point, I just want to give a quick shout out to um, Jessica and everyone at MMB for designing this exercise. We're I know we're only like halfway through or so, but we're get this is I feel like we're getting a lot of really really good input. A lot of um, a lot of complicated pieces of this are all kind of coming together, and it, I, I'm I just want to say I'm I'm I feel I'm really enjoying this exercise. I feel like I, I'm personally getting a lot out of all these perspectives. I echo that. Yeah, I appreciate the facilitation and organization by Stacy and Jess. And Nick. And Nick. Oh, shucks. Thanks, everyone.
All right, is there any more points of discussion on this swap before we move on to a gradients of agreement regarding this high level recommendation for a state medical program with MDMA? Yeah, it looks like some people are already down there, Jessica, so that's terrific. Great, all right, so we'll just move on to the gradients of agreement. Hopefully everyone can provide their feedback. Again, if you are leery or loathe it, please um, let us know why. What would get you to the love it, like it, or live, it, live with it? So we got 16 responses. I'm just waiting on one more. Um, but otherwise, I think we're okay. And if folks are okay with this, we can move on to the same sort of question with a SWOT analysis, but for a medical program with LSD. Uh, so we'll take some time uh, to do the SWOT on a medical program with LSD to identify your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats.
we'll do a few more minutes with the SWAT for the state medical LSD program before we open it up to, for discussion. Also feel free to just um, raise your hand or come on mic and, and ask any questions or thoughts or comments that you wanna share. Say, I have a question for Carolyn um, or maybe Jessica. Uh, I can't remember, but I, I don't think is the, is FDA considering rescheduling LSD at this point? I know there's trials that are in maybe phase three, but <clears throat> is that an open, do, do we have any sense of like a timeline of rescheduling or even if the FDA is even considering it for LSD? Yeah, so uh, they recently granted mind meds um, psilocybin or sorry LSD for generalized anxiety disorder as a breakthrough therapy designation, um, and so they're going to be starting a phase three trial this year. So it's a little bit farther off than psilocybin, which is like deep in the middle in the weeds of their phase three trials, both for major depressive disorder and treatment resistant depression. And then obviously MDMA will have some news next month. Gotcha. Thank you. It, it's there. It's just farther farther back. And Jessica, it looks like people are already, many people are already down on the gradients here. Right. Awesome. I think people are getting in the groove. Nice. I have a question of somebody in the weakness of the recommendation referred to an HLB. What is a HLB? State oh, Health Licensing Board? Mm -hmm. Is that it? Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think that was a big question that came up um, in a lot of different states where Oregon did not negotiate with the licensing boards around whether people with licenses could be psilocybin facilitators given its federal illegality, whereas Colorado did. And they did negotiate an agreement with their licensing board so that they could operate using their license to provide therapy and psilocybin or other natural medicine services. Um, so I'm glad somebody brought that up. Right. Um, I don't know how many people have responded so far. Let's see. Uh, looks like 16. I think that's where we're at. Um, yes, yeah, so maybe we can move on if that one remaining person and then the people that put the loathe it box, if you could put a box underneath of why you loathe it and what may might help you to at least live with it, if at all. <laughs> And with that, um, let's move on to the SWOT analysis for a state medical program with synthetic psilocybin. So the difference between this and magic mushrooms would basically just be the sourcing of the drug supply and what that would look like. Um, so let's kind of, and sort of, you know, whether people are comfortable with the fact that through the medical model, it's the synthetic versions of these things that are moving through, not, not the natural version. Um, so that's kind of where all the efficacy data is so far.
Well, Jessica, just easy, easier to just go ahead and tell you, I meant, can you just restate what you just said about the efficacy? Uh, for synthetic psilocybin, thanks, Helen. Um, so for synthetic psilocybin, that's what is being kind of pushed through the clinical trials process. So all the research that we've been evaluating from Caroline's work has been kind of these synthetic formulations of psilocybin. Well, thanks a bunch. That's really helpful um, as we think about mushrooms and other natural occurring We'll say there is a lot of other, you know, research out there um, with natural mushrooms, and there is some new pharmaceutical companies popping up using naturally derived versions that have additional compounds that are showing some preliminary evidence to do more things in the brain, for example, than just psilocybin alone, kind of a, like cannabis has an entourage effect with all the other things that are in it. Um, so, but, but none of those have been formally run through a clinical trial um, thus far that we've been, that we've reported on yet, so... Is that the actual terminology, entourage effect? I mean, would we really? People, some people call it an entourage. I've heard in the in the space when it comes to mushrooms and psilocybin, it's more of a symphony because it's not because entourage would apply that with cannabis, like THC is the dominant uh -huh. ingredient and everything's kind of supporting it. Whereas with psilocybin, like there's a lot of other things in there and they all kind of act together. Uh -huh. um, and that just hasn't been fully worked out other than like, the thousands of years of its use, you know, in indigenous communities and just recreational yeah. use for the last yeah. many decades. Um, but it hasn't gone through this kind of formal, rigorous, randomized mm -hmm. clinical trial for efficacy. Interesting. Interesting. And I think at some point Caroline mentioned, and Caroline, I don't know if you're on the call, around looking at additional research um, that isn't the RCTs around like population health and statistics and drug use patterns and things like that. Um. Yeah, I I have done that. I've put it in our preliminary outline, um, but I haven't sent it out to anyone, which I, I can do. It's also very long. I don't, I don't write succinctly, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, so we do have some population statistics around use and the, the use is more the natural um, mushrooms instead of, you know, the synthetic psilocybin. So I can send that out. Thanks. I just want to briefly comment too about the level of expertise that our leadership has. Jessica, there has yet to be a question that you don't know the answer to. And, and with the support also of the state staff, unbelievable that we have so many, so much subject matter expertise in this room. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll see, I don't know if everyone knows this, Bennett and I will both be heading out to Harvard Law School at the end of the month to do a psychedelic boot camp for several days. And so hopefully we'll have some interesting stuff to report back on that. It'll be an interesting, lively discussion with people from all sectors of business, pharmaceutical industries, policymakers, scientists, indigenous communities. So it'll be interesting to see what the outcome is of that. That's awesome. I'm glad you're both going. That's Ditto. great, dude. Ditto. That's great. I will be there as well. Oh, wow. <laughs> Did you say you're going too, Michael? No, I just said congrats again. It's awesome. Oh, wow. We'll have three people. That's There's only 30 people in the group. So if th three of us, and I think Ari was on the wait list, I think it's pretty cool. Who was the third person Minnesota, who chimed in? Minnesota is well represented. I'll be there. Representative Smith. Oh, Minnesota. sweet. Congratulations. That's really great. That's awesome. I had a family vacation. Otherwise, I would have applied too but we'll be re well represented. And this is Stacy. It looks like some folks are down in the gradients agreement. If there are no more discussion points that you want to raise up everyone, please go ahead and shift down to the gradients and do your dot voting.
Just some housekeeping with the gradients of agreement. I noticed there's 18 responses in the LSD gradients of agreement. I'm wondering if someone accidentally put their circle in, in there instead of the psilocybin one. I think we have 17 people. So if I'm tracking correctly, everyone, we're still working on the gradients of agreement voting underneath the state medical psilocybin program. If you're lost, wondering where we went, hover over my photo and follow me. I'm right where you need to be. Looks like we're just waiting on three people to submit their gradients of agreement. This one. And that <clears throat> pesky reminder, if you're leery or loathing in your voting, please put a sticky underneath it in that box where my cursor is moving around so we can understand what your concern is. If you've got a way of changing the recommendation, tweaking it, if you will, to get you up to a live with, would love to hear that. And the work group will be using that to... Mm -hmm further refine the recommendation. So it is yep. really important. Yeah, thanks Jess. And some of those issues could even be addressed with additional recommendations, you know, if we're getting into regulations or policies. Um, so it is really important that you give a reason that can help folks move forward. We're still waiting on three folks uh, to provide their gradients of agreement. If you guys could speak now, please.
<clears throat> Meanwhile, looks like others that were finished with their voting are up over in the state medical psilocybin or mushrooms program, posting their comments on the SWAT. So if you have finished voting for the previous question regarding synthetics, perfectly fine to go up and work on the SWAT. But at risk of sounding like a broken record, record, if you haven't voted in the gradients, if you're landing in the, the, the leery and loathe, we really want to hear from you. What's, what, what, is, what are your thoughts? That information is huge for the work group. I don't know if it's happening for anybody else, but I got disconnected a couple of times. Hmm. Go back into the um, so, uh, uh, mural. So I know this. Are you back on? Are you back on now? Yeah, I'm in now. Oh, um, good. My original comment didn't get um, uh, okay. posted, so I went back and posted another one. Oh, good. Thanks, Michael. Uh, that might be the reason why there's an extra dot. Okay. So, but it. And the leadership team <coughs> will be reaching out to those members that weren't able to participate today to make sure they get in to the mural and add their comments and add their votes so that we've got a full complement of feedback. We're on the home stretch, everyone. So this is Jessica's voice. Um, so we'll, we'll wrap this up if folks are moving on to the gradients of agreement. Don't know if there's any points of discussion people want to talk about based on kind of what we heard previously from how Oregon and Colorado are handling their kind of 
service centers or treatment programs, knowing, you know, Colorado hasn't really started yet um, and they've just made their rules. Um, but then I want to do a, also take an opportunity to take another 10 minute break uh, before coming back. Right, I do want to give folks an opportunity to take another break. Um, so, Stacey, if you're okay with that, we'll have folks. Yeah, just one point of clarification. When we do come back, let's just be clear on what is left to do here. Jessica, are, are you wanting to go in um, to that second, the research? Oh, I just missed a typo. Son of a gun. Uh, the research trials area, the section, the second column, or are we moving to any additional uh, discussion that the group has? It's just let's get a get a framework for what we have left. I, given how a little, these have taken a little bit longer, I don't know that we can get through all of them unless it's pretty mm -hmm. straightforward. It might be good to just run through a few if we can. Um, In the research area, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, for the broad recommendation okay. too. Um, if we can get through whatever we can. Um, and then hopefully folks can just kind of chime in as we're talking about this, if they have additional questions and points of discussion to prioritize. Okay. So maybe a five minute break and come back and we'll see where we can get with the research and trials. That sound good. Yep. All right, everyone. We'll see you in uh, five minutes, 12.08. See, see, see. Yeah. Huh? Um, this is Jill. We've got a, a our new office manager starting today, so I'm going to have to cut out of the meeting at this point and tend to his. Schedule. Good to know, Jill. Thanks for letting us know. We appreciate it and appreciate your involvement today. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. Take care. And if you can hear my voice, this is Stacy. We're going to start up in one minute. Stacy, your throat clearing uh, showed up as yeah on the, <laughs> on the captioning. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why that's so funny. I am so sick of me. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Well, it's a 1208, everyone. Again. <laughs> uh, members, if you're here, either pop on camera if you would or do a I don't know, hand clap or some sort of reaction so we know that you're back at the com at your at your computer, please. Thank you, Bennett. Thanks, David. Jessica, thank you.
<clears throat> All right, Jessica, let's go ahead and give it a whirl, shall we? We just have yeah. about 10 min or 20 minutes left before we're wrapping up for the day. And so why don't you talk us through what where you want us to go next? Yeah, so if you could, Stacey, summon everyone to the SWOT analysis for more clinical trials with MDMA. So now we're kind of moving on to this broad recommendation number two, which from our exercise from last month kind of pretty much had almost unanimous support to explore more research trials with these psychedelic medicines. Um, so we'll start with MDMA and then we'll move on to the other substances if we have time. Um, and so this would be basically, you know, do we want to think about exploring what more research trials would look like with MDMA? Um, all of this is already legal, both in the state and federally. It's just sort of figuring out, is this something that we want to explore um, and, and recommend the state allocate funding for? Um, and there might be some additional downstream questions around who would be eligible to do the clinical trials and receive funding. Um, so just kind of keep that in your mind as we're working through whether we want to recommend more research trials with MDMA in the SWOT analysis. If my count is right, we're at 15 voting members right now because Jill had to bow out. So 15 is the magic number when we get down to the gradients. And do we lose one more person? Because we were at 17 before. Uh, good question for which I have no answer. I was just counting on the par uh, participant list, Jessica. We did lose Guthrie. He, I think, always has to leave at noon. So okay. I'll include him on the email to the folks who weren't here. Okay. Thank you. Asking them to add their votes and whatnot. And folks, if you're comfortable with moving down to your gradients of agreement, if you've already provided all your feedback, you can go ahead and do that. It looks like there's still some comments trickling in. Um, one thing I want to note, just as I'm reading some of the comments on the more funding options, is that I, I don't think that we are considering these as mutually exclusive from each other, meaning um, it, that it, it, the, we're, not, we're not asking, I think, as a group, should we create a medicalized model for naturally occurring psilocybin? Should we decriminalize it? Or should we call for more funding? It could be any combination of the three, right? It could be like, the, you, know, some, you, could, you could vote and say, I think we need more funding. I think we should decriminalized, but I, you know, for whatever reason, I don't like the medicalized model of it. So I'm, I'm voting for two, but not the other one. Right. Um, I just am seeing some comments as I'm looking saying like, oh, this would be, I don't like this one as much as the other options. Um, and I just wanted to clarify that, that these are not mutually exclusive options of each other. That right. is correct. You can have all of those recommendations in the same report. Yeah, and I think in Colorado, they, they decriminalized as well as putting a medical program on top of that, recognizing that people might want to access it in a variety of contexts. So decriminalization broadens access, but some people might want to do it with a trained professional in sort of a more legal setting.
Jessica, uh, Jessica, is there anything else we want to pull out for discussion that's emerged from the SWAT tables? Uh, if not, uh, looks like people are down below doing gradients. Yeah, I think we've got a good amount of information. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left in general for the mm -hmm. meeting. So it looks like people are already moving over to the other yeah. boxes as yeah. well, uh, which is totally fine. I encourage that, getting as much information as we can. Um, again, knowing that this whole process is already legal and any drug supply that would come would inherently need to have what's called an investigational new drug um, number with the Food and Drug Administration in order to be used in a clinical trial context. So this wouldn't be kind of an unregulated supply that hasn't been vetted by the FDA that doesn't follow good manufacturing um, protocol for those that are familiar with that terminology. Yeah, Jessica, I meant to ask you this um, at the work group, but does, uh, when you do these um, uh, trials with the VA, are you able to do them on site at the VA or when they're in joint, like if it's a joint trial with like the university, is it, where does it take place? Are you able to do it actually in so you're asking if clinical trials are happening at the VA, and whether there's two sites. Yeah. Um, so we haven't initiated anything yet. We have a we have a grant out trying to get money to do that. But the idea would be for the study you're talking about is doing it at the VA, and they have all the inpatient facilities to monitor safety and whatnot. And then it's just getting the VA IRB to approve the protocol, getting the money, getting the Schedule One license from the DEA, and getting the pharmaceutical product that has been approved by the FDA to be used in a clinical trial. So all that needs to happen for it to be implemented, and that can happen in any location that you know has the the facilities and resources to you know manage a Schedule One drug in terms of like a research pharmacy, so they can make sure it's kept under lock and key, and then they have the appropriate medical equipment uh, to monitor people. It theoretically can happen at both places. The VA just has a lot more inpatient facilities for things like this. There is a clinical research unit at the U that is staffed with medical personnel for clinical trials as well. Oh, thank you. So yeah, it looks like we're just kind of, everyone's just um, providing feedback in general across all four, which I really appreciate and the efficiency of this so that the working groups can kind of come up with some additional things to discuss next month. And we'll, we'll give this about uh, five plus three, eight more minutes. I think at least from the MAD perspective, we wouldn't, um, we'd, we'd appreciate uh, maybe a minute or two of that time, Jessica, so we can just debrief the group and find out how this process has been working for them. Yep. Um, if they're feeling like they've had enough discussion time, enough um, opportunity to share their own opinion or vote or make their comments. So a little debriefing would be great. Yes, yeah, so maybe we give this just one more minute and then we'll open it up for discussion and debrief so that we can kind of close out by 1225. Terrific. Okay. And what do you think, Jessica? Yeah, I think we'll wind this down. Obviously, folks can keep adding to things um, if you want after the meeting. You can keep engaging with Mural if there's more you want to add or digest. Um, but yeah, I think it's a good opportunity now for folks to chime in on kind of how did this process feel? Did it seem effective? Did you feel like you were able to share your perspective? Is there anything we could do better for the next meeting to try to kind of bust through all these, these decisions, <laughs> talk about them and come to a consensus? Open to feedback. Hoping for feedback, Hoping wanting for feedback. feedback. Please give us feedback. I will say, um, Bennett, thanks for bringing that up with the uh, either or situation because I, after reading some of the comments, I was starting to question some of the uh, 
choices that I made, but thanks for clarifying that. Um, I think that's super important. Great. Thanks, Michael. Adam? I thought this was a good process. I think that we are able to have a discussion and have a conversation with a lot of people speaking at the same time uh -huh. in a way that I, I don't think we would have been able to do if it was just a conventional conversation where one person speaks uh -huh. at a time and uh -huh. addresses or responds to other people's comments. So I like it. Thank uh -huh. you. Great. Good. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Adam. So, go ahead, Helen. Well, I think it was a good process also for the volume of material that this group needed to, to go through and, the, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the number of people who were engaged in it. I mm -hmm. would say, though, that uh, I, I'm assuming and thinking that uh, part of the background steps will be that this information will be compiled. And, you know, some of us kind of like to see things in, in order in a document, mm -hmm. like in a table, because mm -hmm. then we can kind of see what, you know, Cause, because for me, I want to make sure I put my comments in the right box, you know, because there is that challenge of technology. But yeah. having said that, I think the, having the information laid out differently so that you can see what compartments they actually fell into helps mm -hmm. when you begin to talk about next steps and what do we really think. Yeah. You know, so thank you. It was, I thought Thanks, it was a great Tom. process. Thank you for watching. Good. Having used Mural quite a lot with larger groups, we'll all get to that point where we go, yeah, Mural's no, not working anymore. We need to see it in some different sort of form. We'll, we'll know. We'll know. Uh, it'll become pretty obvious uh, to all of us. So thank you for that. Any other comments about what's working, what's not working? Margaret, go ahead. Yeah, I think the way it's organized, the SWOT analysis is amazing. For me, it was hard because even though I did my homework leading up to this, mm -hmm. to have to think and listen at the same time made my brain go like, I, sometimes I had to hit like mute, I muted everyone just so I could get think clearly mm -hmm. in my own, how I wanted to say something. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was kind of hard to multitask in that way. I think it would have been super helpful to have like, and I know this would have taken more time, like an overview right at the beginning, kind of like refreshing all the things, because I did my own research review and stuff before I arrived today, just to refresh. But I felt like I was having to think and have an opinion at the exact same time. So I love the process. I just wish that I had a little bit more space. Mm, yeah. And when you say research or background, you're talking about something different, Margaret, than the um, flow charts that um, we were unpacking at the very beginning, right? Right. I mean, I wanted to refresh my own understanding of every single topic, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Of all the ones we've been through and mm -hmm. to synthesize so that I could arrive with a clear yeah. decision, right? Or opinion. Yeah. 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 Yep. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that, Margaret. Would that be helpful next time to just kind of at the beginning in general to just kind of be like what reminder of what we've learned thus far? Yeah, just like, you know, yeah, I think that would have been even if there was a homework. I mean, that seems silly, but an exercise I could have moved through before arriving today, like I did it myself, but I I think it would have been clearer for me and I would have mm -hmm. been. Able, yeah, I don't mm -hmm. know. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Thank you. This has been most helpful. Um, Jessica, do you want to close us out and uh, remind people to, about when their next meeting is and any other closing things that we have to take care of? Yeah, I want to real quick give Courtney an opportunity to ask. Oh, her. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Courtney. I didn't see no, your I hand up. I just wanted to say, make sure I'm clear on this. We can also just keep continuing to go in if things come to us and edit in mural Absolutely. for some time. Yeah. You just can't go in and, and add more votes when you've already Correct. done your, yeah. your dot vote. Yeah. 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 Um, so I just want to say thank you so much to everyone. This was a very productive meeting. I'm really glad we were able to get through and get and get so much engagement. Um, it's really going to be helpful over the next month for the working groups to kind of tease this apart and figure out the sort of like who, what, when, where, why of each of these things and what could potentially be regulations and statutory changes that we then can talk about next month. Um, so that'll be mostly done by the working group. 
Um, so there is an opportunity for member feedback um, that you can leave on Mural, as we were just discussing. Uh, you can also ask questions to Jess Burke. You can also email me. Um, my email is on the task force website. Um, our next full task force meeting will be Monday, August 5th. Um, same time, same place. Um, and then there will be two working group meetings this next month on the second and fourth Thursday of the month um, from 4 to 5 p.m. Um, and we'll be doing a lot more work um, on all of this feedback um, and being able to figure out how to integrate it and come up with more uh, decision decisions to talk about and getting closer to actually making official votes on what our final recommendations will be moving forward and starting our writing of the report. Um, so thank you all so much for your attention and engagement. Thank you to the people watching um, on YouTube for your attention. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next month at our next meeting. And thank you all for attending and have a good rest of your week and month and 4th of July celebrations. Bye. Bye, folks.